Welcome back, everyone. We are a little bit late, but it's time for our next talk. It's about how not to scale your Prometheus. From Kush and Nicola. All right. Can everybody hear me? Good. All right. So uh, we just want to start out with uh, just asking a couple of questions. Hey, everyone. So I know we are at the Prometheus Day, but I just want to start out asking that. How many of you are using Prometheus? Good. OK. Fair. That's everyone. Uh, awesome. So uh, how many of you self-manage your deployments? Fewer. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Gotcha. And then I think one of the big questions is, how many of you have had trouble scaling those deployments or have had trouble with the stability? Yeah, fairish number. Got it. <laughs> Great. So <laughs> nice. Well, we do have phase scaling issues, and Prometheus going into crash loop back off a lot of times. So worry not. So we hope that after the stock ends, you would have some fruitful insights that how not to scale your Prometheus and go on the right way. So hey everyone, good afternoon. I'm Kush Trivedi, and he's my colleague Nicola Collins. We are platform engineers at DevRev. And today, we plan to talk you through some of the mistakes we made while taking shortcuts with her Prometheus deployment so that you don't have to go through them. Yep. So, um, yeah. so as Kush mentioned, uh, we work at DevRev, and we're on the platform side of things. And uh, at DevRev, we really own the infrastructure to support our uh, developer-oriented API-first uh, CRM, our dev CRM. Um, and with that, I can kind of talk you through a little bit of at least what our um, topology looks like, right? So we are Kubernetes. We are primarily EKS. And then we initially started out with some particularly small nodes. Um, on top of that, we use Argo CD heavily, um, Istio for service mesh. We use Kiali to visualize our mesh. And then we use Grafana initially early on uh, to, to do some visualizations of some internal metrics. So on top of that, when Kush and I started this, we had around 20 microservices that we were supporting. Today, we're up to approximately 70. And then on top of that, when we started all of this out, we were uh, primarily Datadog shop. So we dumped everything from our metrics to our tracing, logging, straight into Datadog. And that's where all of our developers are used to working out of. So as Nick said, Daredog was our one-stop observability platform. And being honest, it worked pretty well for us in terms of visualization of matrix, application performance monitoring, and correlation between multiple toolings. But soon, costs started increasing significantly with Datadog. Up until this point, we had the luxury of dumping everything to Datadog without worrying about the cost. But now we had to become more discerning. So we decided to go ahead with a hybrid observability model where we would have a cloud provider as well as end cluster observability setup. So that's when we decided to move some of our observability setup concerned around our platform and infrastructure to Prometheus. And since we were very new to Prometheus, we didn't know how to manage it very well. So we did commit a lot of mistakes while going along the way. Yeah, so our first attempt or really our first interaction with Prometheus was indirect. It was, um, it was a necessity to visualize our service mesh metrics. And uh, just to get that rolling, we simply installed the example Prometheus YAML that came with our Istio install. Uh, but we, are, we try our best to deploy and control everything out of Argo. So we pretty quickly moved to the Prometheus, the, the most basic Prometheus uh, chart, Helm chart. So one of the things that we immediately noticed and were informed of was our data costs, uh, our data dog cost essentially doubled overnight as soon as we turned on these mesh metrics. So that was a, a pretty uh, stark realization. So the, the first quick answer was, all right, let's filter those out. We, we don't really, our, our app team, our developers don't really need those metrics. They're more for us to internally debug. So we, we filtered those out and we started dumping them directly into our local Prometheus instance. Um, that led to the first real instability actually in our cluster is we noticed that this Prometheus pod just kept going down. It just kept going down. So initially our first, my first question or I asked to Kush was just turn on the horizontal pod autoscaler and everything should be fine. But he quickly informed me that's not really an answer. So 
Uh, the next thing we did was obviously just try to throw more memory at it. And with our tiny nodes, we capped that out pretty quickly. And then in the last ditch effort, we just we tried the vertical pod autoscaler without really investigating or diving too deeply, but that actually led to us having node instability. So we, we backed that out. Um, we backed that out almost immediately, but um, yeah. So our Prometheus was still crashing, and it has been few past past few weeks since no one was actually looking at the Prometheus metrics. And as Nick mentioned, that there were no product critical metrics in our Prometheus, and we were just using those for debugging some internal infra issues, which were related to networking. But then things started changing pretty soon when we started to explore Kenry deployments for our microservices. We were already using Istio and Argo CD setup, and guess what? It's what all we needed to start our migration to Kenry rollout strategy. We quickly installed Argo rollouts and started exploring subset-based routing via Istio. And now we needed an in-cluster observability solution to monitor the matrix. There were two reasons why we needed an in-cluster solution. First thing, for latency reasons, we didn't want to send all those Kenry matrix to some cloud provider and fetch them every five seconds just to make sure that how Kenry pod is working well. And to make sure that we don't slow down our deployment pipelines, we needed, again, an in-house solution which could provide us with APIs and we can query our matrix every five seconds, six seconds, whatever is our frequency. So that's the point when we started that we need to start working on strengthening our Prometheus setup. And this was the first time that Prometheus availability directly impacted our deployment pipeline, and we needed to fix that thing. Yeah, so as availability or, I guess, uptime went from annoying to critical, we took a much, I'd say, more focused approach on this. And uh, the next piece was, and based on, like, the very loose research was, well, if we can't optimize a single instance of Prometheus, maybe we should start partitioning or sharding our data between multiple instances. And uh, just the logical grouping that we went with initially is we'll put all of our cluster metrics in one Prometheus instance. We'll put our service mesh metrics in another instance. And then uh, we'll put all of our app metrics everything else that our, uh, our, our dev teams are looking at in a, a third instance. And uh, it was at this point we realized that, okay, we have two very stable Prometheus installs, but we have, again, a very uh, unreliable mesh instance. So it, it, in some ways it worked well. It, at least we uh, minimized the blast radius, but at the same time, we essentially ended up with the same problem, and that is we have one Prometheus instance that every day we look at it, it ran into an out-of-memory error, and that out-of-memory error leads to a crash loop back off. And then that crash loop back off, well, our probes are timing out, so let's increase probes. And as soon as we increase probes as long as we can get, out-of-memory error again and again and again. So, so how do you fix one of the Prometheus instance, which is always crashing? As Nick said, our two-third of Prometheus was stable. We are getting cluster matrix. We are getting custom matrix. But again, the mesh instance was super unstable. So what we did back then was we just deleted the PVC, restarted the pause, and boom. A Prometheus was back again for two to three hours until it reached the limit of the matrix and started going to crash loop back off again. We needed to fix this. Yeah, so... So let's look at all the things up until now which we had tried to uh, make our Prometheus more stable. We tried vertical scaling. We tried putting on more limits, more request limits to Prometheus, but again, it breached all of them, and things started going to crash to back off very soon. We <coughs> started using vertical autoscaler, but then the vertical autoscaler meant Prometheus increase its limits, which in turn led to kubelet going to crashing state, ultimately bringing our nodes down. And when the nodes were down, some of our critical service started going down because Prometheus was scheduled with one of those services. Then we tried isolation to limit the blast radius. We started scheduling Prometheus on a dedicated node, but again, Prometheus soon breached those limits, and one of our node was always down. And trust me, nobody likes a Kubernetes cluster with one of its node always down. We started pushing more resource at the problem, so we bumped the node size. And now we were at 16 gigs of memory and 8 core CPU. During that time, we might say that our Prometheus was pretty stable, but up until that, we started querying the matrix from past 48 hours, past 36 hours. And that's when the query started. Prometheus breached the limits again, and things started going to OM. So we were back to zero. Yeah, so now we start exploring really what's our last option. And um, Kush mentioned this operator model, so this Prometheus operator. And I think the thought was, at least on my side, is, well, we have this problem with instability. But if we can recover gracefully, 
without manual intervention. We can worry about it later. And uh, so th we just blindly, again, a blind attempt to just install some more technology in the hope that it fixed the problem. And we actually resulted up with the exact same thing we had before, two very stable Prometheus instances and one inherently unstable uh, Prometheus instance that essentially just ends with out of memory near the end of its first retention window. So uh, it's really at this point that I felt we tried everything. And I also very much appreciate that uh, Kush to kinda took it upon himself so yeah, and before we get into that, just really quick again. So more resources doesn't work. We can't go horizontal. Isolating it potent stops impacting other services. Federating it got us stable where we didn't have issues. Um, and then operator didn't help us particularly much. So it's at this point that Kush, I think, uh, took it much deeper and really decided to own the problem. So what do you do when the thing works? We were done with hit and trials. We were done with bumping from random GitHub issues about Prometheus going to crash, Prometheus going to OOM. So that's when we started to holistically dive into the Prometheus documentation. It's working. We started reading a lot of blog posts, articles, and <laughs> we came to know that there were few things which were very fundamentally wrong by how we were installing and managing a Prometheus deployment. So we were first went to the brand Brazil's Prometheus memory calculator where we gave all the inputs we had, and it came out that we needed 33 gigs of memory to make sure our Prometheus runs in stable state. Well, coming from T3 micro nodes to a node with 32 gigs is not something which we can easily afford for its startup. So that's when we started looking at the problem more briefly, and we found out that our scrape interval was too small. We were scraping everything at five seconds, which was too frequent. So we bumped up our scale, sc scrape interval, Second thing was that we had 3 million time series. Honestly, I don't know if we actually needed the, the, this much time series. That's when we stumbled upon the blog by Thomas De Giacinto around how to investigate the high memory usage by Prometheus. We used the TSDB analyze tool to identify <clears throat> what were the high cardinality matrix, what were the matrix with the highest number of labels. And then we used the Grafana MIMI tool where we came to know that what all matrix do we only need to make sure that our Grafana dashboards are working correctly and we are getting all the absolute data we need. So we started dropping all the news matrix. We started reducing the labels. And things started becoming more and more stable. And then we stumbled upon this your documentation around where it was mentioned that if any of your call is coming from out of the mesh or if any of your call is going out of the mesh, Istio by default marks the destination service as the host header. What it can do is it can result in very high cardinal destination service matrix. So then we disable the host at a fallback in our clusters. And boom, a Prometheus was way more stable than it was ever. ever. And now you ask me how, you, like, how we know that our Prometheus was stable. So ever since we made these changes, our Prometheus average memory usage has been around 3.5 gigs. It's still scheduled on the node with 6 gigs of memory. And during querying, the peak goes to 5.5 gigs of memory usage. There was still a very manual intervention, which we still need to do, was that during the peak times when HPA used to kick in, a cluster used to go to 500 or 450 pods. And that's when, we, that's when the PVC used to fill up. So we were still manually intervening with the PVCs, increasing the PVC size from 8 to 12 gigs, 12 to 16 gigs. And as of now, we are having around 1 million series with 3 million chunks, and Prometheus is working well for now. And since Prometheus has been stable for us, there are a lot of different teams which are now looking at exposing custom matrix with their microservices so that they can have matrix-based monitoring. Yep. So this is the one area really in our entire infrastructure that we can't rely on auto-scaling, I would say, and it's not that we exclusively rely on it. It's just this is a much more manual tuning than I would have hoped or expected. So I think it's on Kush and I now to, number one, we have to really understand the data that we're ingesting, and we have to be a little bit more proactive with our strategy as we're, pre number one, a one-day retention is not an answer, so we know we're going to have to bump that up pretty significantly here. Um, but at least we have a baseline, and from that baseline, we can have some type of, um, you know, deterministic uh, scale model. 
So on top of that, we have a dev team that is pretty spoiled by their dashboards in a single place and all of their metrics and everything. And as we split that up, we really have to have an answer from a, from a usability standpoint. And uh, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a lofty goal to get to what they have today, but what we really can't have is three or four or five different places to get metrics. So that opens up a new, a new issue for us or something that we're gonna definitely have to tackle, which is this idea of instance aggregation and more, let's say more long-term retention. And from there, we've done very, very brief research, but things like Thanos, Cortex, uh, M3. Yeah, there are some other, other options out there, but that's definitely next on our list. And then another big thing for us is these, you know, these, these metrics are particularly important to our developers and developers are our customers at DevRev. So we've been trying to figure out what's the best way to number one, use some of these metrics internally to let's say kick off internal tickets or issues, programmatically feed back into the platform. And then another thing that we do is we kind of have the opportunity to visualize some of your uh, infrastructure or some of your, what we call parts. Um, we think there's definitely an opportunity to do some real time data display by feeding that back in. But that really wraps it up for us. We I'm glad to answer any questions that you have and also thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. Oh, we have a question over here. Hi guys, um, so when you said that you guys were aggregating all the data in the Prometheus, was your Prometheus the only source for metrics or you guys were aggregating and pushing it somewhere else? Like when you said, talked about the retention. Yes. So when you said 24 hours, 36 hours, or like whatever that time frame is. So you get your Prometheus was the only store or you guys were still pushing it elsewhere to have like a week store or a month store, or something like that purely one day at this point. So we have not yet looked past that. And that's primarily because the metrics that we have today are used for our internal debugging. We don't really have that use case. And at the moment, our app business metrics, our developer important metrics, they're in Datadog. And, and that's where uh, the retention becomes at the moment more important. But long term, we have to be able to answer this. OK. Cool, I think that's right. Any other questions? So would you say the Federation was necessary looking back or would you maybe have waited if you could have figured it out first? Like, would you still do it if you had to go back? If, if we didn't have to, I don't think we would have, right? Like if I have, if, if you can scale without me deciding arbitrary, like partitions in our data. I would much, much rather prefer that personally. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't think we have another answer to that, or at least for what we've come across. So as of now, our data is still federation based. And for long term, we are planning to have each microservice has a federated Prometheus, which will again be aggregated by global Prometheus, which by then we could have a Thanos for a different cluster Prometheus, which can aggregate around multi-cluster setup. So we can have long-term retention. Right, we have another question over here. Uh, so you said uh, you had issues with high cardinality data. What approach did you uh, use to resolve that? We used the MIMIR tool by Grafana, which told us that what all matrix we actually needed for our dashboards. Second, we used the TSDB analyze, which told us that what were the matrix which were limiting a lot of labels. And then we checked that, do we even need that much? Uh, how did you get rid of it? Like, did you uh, went back to change the matrix that, like, refactor the matrix that you had, or uh, how did you go about it? Can you pardon? So how did you, like, uh, resolve it, right? Like We dropped the matrix, which we didn't need it. Okay. 